Welcome to this edition of Editor's Notebook. My name is Mark O'Keefe. I'm executive editor for the Herald Standard. With us today is Erica Usher. Erica is with the Fayette County Drug and Alcohol Commission. I want to thank you very much for being on our show today. I want to talk uh, about uh, there was a recent uh, study, a survey of uh, high school kids here in Fayette County. And uh, the survey was a little uh, disconcerting somewhat. Uh, well, they're probably not real surprising <laughs> to, to people, folks kind of like you in, in the know, but 46% uh, of uh, high school students in Fayette County admitted to, to, to drinking alcohol. Uh, before you maybe think that's really crazy, 44% uh, was the state average. So we're a little bit above, but it's not like, well, we're like double the average or whatever. And I think marijuana, it was... Uh, 19% and the average for the statewide was 17%. We are actually a little bit lower than the but statewide low, average. A little bit yeah. lower, okay, yes. it's reverse. Mm -hmm. I think it was 17 for us and 19. And then cigarettes, I think, was a little bit higher, 27%, yeah. where the average is 23%. So, but, you know, I think it, it's good to get these um, numbers out there and make people aware. I mean, it's things that are going on, so, you know, and you can kind of bury your head in. To say there's kind of two things with this, you know, either you could, some people tend to maybe, you know, kind of gloss over things and they'll say, well, not my kid or whatever. But then you have other people that are like convinced that every kid's doing this kind of Correct. stuff, you know. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I think, you know, it's good to get these numbers out there so parents can be aware that, yeah, there's alcohol and probably alcohol is more prevalent than than really marijuana out there. So, you know, uh, this is something that, that you really need to be, be careful of. But let's talk about um, the, the Fayette County Drug and Alcohol Commission and, and your role with it. What, what is your title now? I'm the prevention supervisor at our office. Um, Fayette County Drug and Alcohol is made up of four units, and all of those units are responsible for different services that we deliver. So prevention, my, eight, my unit, um, we do prevention, and so that's awareness and education. We do classroom presentations. We do ongoing classroom programs. You know, where we're invited in can and fit that into the school schedule. Um, we work with the student assistance program as liaisons and offer um, referral and support for kids that need outside school um, interventions. And we talk to people, we put billboards up, we put TV commercials on, anything that we can do to sort of bring awareness to issues related to alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, that's our responsibility. Our office also has outpatient treatment, and so we have a treatment unit, we have a case management unit. Their responsibility is to assess um, someone's appropriate level of care. So if someone is seeking treatment, for some people, outpatient treatment is appropriate. That's where you meet with a counselor, you go to an office, you have an appointment, you go home, you, you live your life normally. Um, inpatient treatment is a rehab facility where someone actually goes and stays there for 7, 10, 21, 30, mm -hmm. if you're incredibly mm -hmm. lucky, 30 days, um, and work on what they need to towards sobriety and then could come out and also participate in outpatient treatment. So case managers sort of assess where someone needs to be, what's appropriate for them. And then we also have a DUI unit. So anyone that gets a DUI in Fayette County is required by law to participate in two things. You have to have an evaluation. It's called a court reporting network evaluation or CRIN. And you also have to participate in alcohol highway safety school, which is a 12 and a half hour class. So we offer both of those at our office and the DUI unit is responsible for that. Now, if someone gets a DUI, they may also have to do other things as well, but everyone, by law, has to have a CRIN and has to participate in class. So those are the responsibilities of all of our units. And mm -hmm. we all have to work together because many times um, what one unit is doing impacts another, and there's, it's, there's a lot of connection. So we have to collaborate as supervisors of those individual units and keep our doors open for everyone that, that needs us or is interested in information. And so you've been working with the uh, Drug and Alcohol Commission for 10 years. Yes, I believe 10 years in the fall. And so, you know, what may be have some of the changes or some of the things that you've seen um, just during your time, you know, that seems, things seem to be getting worse, better, just kind of maybe in general? Or um, 
Well, there's cycles mm -hmm. for everything. And popular drugs that were sort of the hot topic, maybe when I first started, there are some things that change. What has not changed is our country's love affair with alcohol and tobacco products, mm -hmm. especially in Fayette County. And that's been pretty consistent for this whole time. Um, as, as something that we wanted to look at and to focus on. Now, we can talk about other drugs of abuse too, what people are seeking treatment for from uh, heroin and other opiates to um, you know, people using prescription drugs from people using that marijuana. Stuff's here too. Absolutely, right. absolutely. Right. And you know, when when we want to talk about specifically the the pays data and what it shows, you know, I've said before, data is data. You can look at it, and now we have to let's talk about what that means. Mm -hmm. There are other things that people are doing, and I don't want to minimize the fact that prescription drug abuse is use and abuse is rampant in our country, and that is something that needs to be addressed. And prescription drug abuse, specifically painkillers, are so closely related to heroin abuse in our country because heroin is a pain reliever. So if you have a script for something, you know, you're, you're getting Oxycontin or Vicodin or whatever, and now the doctor says you really you don't need this anymore. You know, you had surgery and you have it for a length of time and now you're done and now you can't get your script anymore and people start buying those things on the street or doctor shopping and now when you can't get your script anymore, there's heroin as an option mm -hmm. because it acts the same you way in the body. You want to get that, hair, that high again, I well, guess. Well, and I think what people need to understand is that many times when someone is farther along in, in their abuse, it's not so much about getting high anymore as to like, feeling normal, that that is normal and to be able to function. If we want to talk about drugs that have significant physical withdrawal, there are many people that are using whatever they're using just so they don't get sick and so they feel okay. And, and that's a very human thing to do because, I mean, let's think the last time that maybe we were sick, I know that I've taken cold pills because I wanted to make sure that I was able to function and could go to work and do what I needed to do. So if you think of it that way, someone who without this is physically ill and unable to function, that's what they're going to continue to do so they can go on with their life. So all of these things are, again, like go in cycles and there are other things that, that we can talk about. What I've really been trying to explain to people is we can't forget about alcohol just because it's a legal substance. And we can't forget about tobacco because it's a legal substance. That's some of the, the main reasons why we shouldn't forget about it because due to its availability, <laughs> The, the likelihood, of, I mean, it's, it's available, so right. anybody could, could purchase it. Even if you say, you know, well, it's only legal for someone of a certain age. The reality is, if it's legal for someone, regardless of age, it's easier for anyone to get that substance, whether because some, uh, a clerk is not um, well-versed in the law and what they need to do to card people or to check, or because they're not interested in that because they're selling to someone that they know and it's a friend or someone that they're intimidated by. I remember being a, a young cashier. Um, that was the first job that I had at a local grocery store. And I hated when people would come in and purchase tobacco products because our rule at the store was that you always had to card them. Mm -hmm. If they looked younger than 50, you needed to card them. I can't tell you how many people would get so angry right. and would be downright nasty because you were asking them, yeah. well, I, I, I can't gauge how old somebody is. Right. And you, you may be 18, 19, 20, you could be 30, I don't know. But because I don't know, I need to ask that. Some people may not feel that way and be, you know, be intimidated right. by asking that question. And so now there are people that are purchasing it. Or uh, another aspect of that, adults that legally purchase alcohol and then provide them to minors because it's a younger sibling or a cousin or even parents that buy for their kids because it's only alcohol. Right. Well, the reality is that alcohol is probably one of the most dangerous drugs that there is. And I say that, and that's probably going to be this, this, I can't even believe that she said that, but that's 100% true. If you want to look at impact on the body and what it does to you, alcohol is an incredibly dirty drug. There's not one system in your body that it does not impact. And when I mentioned earlier about physical withdrawal and people feeling sick, and when we place um, clients in an inpatient facility, and they have to go through withdrawal from whatever drug there is because they're working towards sobriety, if someone is alcohol dependent, they have to be placed in a specialty, a medical facility. You have to be medically monitored to withdraw from alcohol. So someone that's addicted to heroin or crack or other substances, 
You're going to have horrible physical withdrawal. You may feel like you're going to die, but you won't. Withdrawal from alcohol will kill you if your body is dependent upon it. So, or can kill you. I shouldn't say will kill you. Can kill you. So, that's crazy. Yeah. And then this is a legal substance. Now, I'm not saying it, it, it shouldn't be legal. Right. What I'm saying is that many people, because it's legal, sort of gloss over our responsibility about knowing about what it is. And we're just sort of oblivious to that. I, I think we live in a society that if you can buy it at the store, then it's okay. Well, don't you think, too, that probably a lot of parents are drinking? <laughs> so well, then, absolutely. So then they think, you know, it'd be one thing, like, if you find, you know, say, say a bag of pot in your kid's pocket or something, people would be freaking out where, uh, so maybe they find that they're, you know, a beer bottle or something. Well, there's not going to be the same reaction. Absolutely. It's not going to be the same. Right. So it's, it is kind of more acceptable, but like you say, it's it really is more of a more of a problem, and you know yes. people do need to be aware, particularly with young people when they're yes. when they're drinking and they're more maybe prone to have more problems, and yeah. you know, there's going to be <clears throat> more consequences to things that that, that they're doing. Alcohol. Um well, if we want to talk about just sort of addiction and how you know use and dependence and, and what it does to the body, um, addiction absolutely causes changes in the brain, specifically around the areas responsible for judgment and impulse control. And if you want to look at adolescents, teenagers specifically, that's an area of their brain that is under intense development at that time. They're not fully developed. And anyone who knows a teenager or who has a teenage <laughs> child knows that. That's not necessarily their strong point, rightfully so, because their brain isn't fully developed in that area yet. So we expect them to not be masters of judgment and masters of impulse control. That's their nature. That's what they're working on. So because of that, you add a substance in there, it can permanently change the way that area of the brain functions. Because use and we're talking about decision making and again, judgment, impulse control, all of that's related. Introducing a substance at that age when that brain is developing can cause lifelong, lifelong changes in the brain. That's why it's so important for us to talk about adolescent use. Because if you're introducing a substance at that time when that brain is forming, it's much more likely that they're going to end up dependent on that substance. So, you know, anyone can say, well, you know, I drink or, you know, I use alcohol. I'm not saying that that's wrong. Uh, by no means at all. Like, our, our office isn't for prohibition. We're for the responsible use of alcohol. But I, I sort of want to task people to understand what that means when I say responsible use. And for teenagers, it's no use. And part of it's because the law says you have to be 21. But the other part is because if you're introducing that when they're younger, it's more likely that they will end up dependent on that substance later. We never want someone to be dependent on a substance. We don't want someone to deal with addiction. That's a primary chronic lifelong disease that they have to deal with. So, you know, I don't want that for anybody. So we need to delay their first use for as late as possible, uh, you know, maybe even beyond 21 years of age, but at least until 21 years of age. Otherwise, we're sort of setting them up to have a problem. But many people don't realize that. And you right. say, like, oh, well, you know, alcohol is acceptable, you know, at parties and weddings and, and all of these situations where that's a part of our society. And again, that is acceptable, but you need to recognize that even though this is a legal, acceptable substance, here are some potential consequences and sort of be aware of that. You right. can still use it and make choices related to alcohol if you have all the information. And sometimes I worry that maybe people don't have all of the information just because we look to our culture for those cues. And if the culture isn't really aware of it, then you know we're not being very um, diligent consumers. Yeah, and I think too, a lot of times, you know, kids can kind of fool you in a way, like they can be, they can seem like they're very mature, and mm -hmm. so sometimes, you know, maybe parents might think, well, you know, he's pretty, he's okay, he's mm -hmm. responsible, whatever, but it's just such a slippery slope that yeah. you get into, and, you know, uh, it's just such, like you say, it's such a dangerous kind of age in, in that kind yes. of uh, sense, so you really do have to really be careful and, you know, really give this some some second and third thoughts yeah. and you know we always our advice to parents always is you want to give youth the opportunity to make good decisions 
you want to expect that they're probably going to make some poor ones, but you still want to give them the opportunity with enough oversight that when they do make poor decisions, that it's not these catastrophic consequences and there can be an early intervention. I'm a parent too. Now, fortunately, my children are not teenagers yet. Fingers crossed that you know we're going to be we'll be able to manage when, when the time comes. But I, I, you have to be very aware of that. You have to give them opportunity you know, to make the right choice, but don't be surprised when they make poor choices and almost expect that that's going to happen at least a couple of times because how else do you learn? Right. You, you learn to make smart decisions when you make a good choice and there's a positive outcome and if you make a poor choice, there's a negative consequence. I also think that we have a, we have a, a society of we want to protect our youth. Again, speaking as a parent, I understand that but sometimes there needs to be a consequence. Mm. That if you make a poor decision and we protect them from all aspects of that poor decision, I don't, they haven't learned anything right. from that experience. So uh, an example I always use, when I was small, um, my parents had a, a, a small, um, it was like a wood-burning stove, and I was fascinated by this. And I mean, I still remember um, being fascinated and I'm always saying, you can't touch it, you can't touch it, you can't touch it. So, of course, what did I do? I touched it. I burned my hand. Horrible, horrible. Um, and my dad always says, you know, afterwards, I would, I would never go anywhere near it. I'd make this big, like, round circle to make sure that, you know, whatever he was doing, if he was by it, that I was nowhere near it. Now, I'm not encouraging anybody to, like, you know, harm your children. Right. But the idea is that there are natural consequences and if we protect them from that then they don't learn if i would have touched it and it and it didn't burn me the chances are i probably would have but touched it again right. but right. the reality was i touched it I, I got burned i had this horrible consequence i was never going to touch it again because that was such a negative consequence right. to me so it's just something to be aware of we really want to encourage parents to talk to their kids have dialogue say you know this is what my expectation is and when you don't meet that expectation Here's the consequence. You know, you, you drink and you're underage. Um, whether or not the police are involved, that's not acceptable to me. This is going to be your consequence. Here's my punishment, sort of a, making sure that there is a consequence to, to curb that negative behavior. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. At TheHeraldStandard.com, our mission is to provide news, information, and services to enable our communities to prosper. Every day, we strive to achieve this goal through three dynamic products. Wake up each morning to a copy of the HeraldStandard.com newspaper delivered to your home. Enjoy the e-edition and exact replica of our print product on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Or secure unlimited access to our full coverage digital news site online at HeraldStandard.com. One local news leader, three great options. Okay, welcome back to this editor's notebook. My name is Mark O'Keefe. I'm executive editor for the Herald Standard, and with me today is Erica Usher. She's from the Fayette County Drug and Alcohol Commission, and we we're talking about the uh, recent study that uh, showed that uh, kids in uh, high school students in Fayette County, 46% had uh, drank alcohol um, as opposed to the state average, which was 44%. So in the first part, we're kind of talking about, you know, what this, what this means and what, you know, parents and what they should be looking out for and why it's important that kids should not be drinking while they're, you know, particularly in, in high school age and while they're, you know, till they turn 21. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about the study in and of itself because, you know, these, it's, the study was kids admitted this. So yes. what kind of, you know, because a lot of people are probably saying, well, is that, you know, are, accurate, they, is that? are they admitting too much or, you know, admitting too little? What, what, is, what is it about the study that to you makes it reliable? Um, well, the Pennsylvania Youth Survey, or the PAYS survey, as it's affectionately known, um, is actually done by the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And they do it every two years for 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students across the state. And the goal is to have some good statewide data, and that helps Pennsylvania compare our, us to the nation in, uh, again, survey tools like the Monitoring the Future survey that looks at national statistics. So this is some good Pennsylvania data. And how they set it up, they invite schools to participate um, and survey their students. Anyone can participate if they would like. There's just some cost associated with that. If the state, if you're part of the statewide sample, the random statewide sample, then you can participate for free. And then you get your data, and your data is included in the statewide data. 
So um, our office became involved because we realized, well, I have some anecdotal information. Um, I didn't have any way to, to say, is this just what we believe? We really wanted some local data. So we actually wrote for a couple of grants, and we were able to pay for our county to participate. And I'm so very pleased to say that all the districts were willing um, and that we surveyed students in 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade countywide. Um, now, were there some kids that maybe didn't participate because their parents chose for them to not be a part of it? Uh, yes, or because they were absent that day or whatever. But uh, truthfully, there were a lot of people that participated in this survey. And this is probably the most um, information that we've, we've ever had at the county level. Um, so it, it's done every two years. It's done in the fall, and then the data is compiled and, and, and released. When, we, when you look at the survey, it's anonymous. So you know, you, their name isn't attached to it. They're given time to complete. If we want to look at the accuracy of it, it is self-reported. So this is youth admi you know, admitting as to what they're doing. How can we say that, that it's valid? There are a lot of questions that are asked in multiple ways throughout the survey. So at any time when the, the researchers are evaluating, if there's a survey where kids have answered inconsistently to questions, then their survey is pulled out as invalid. There are some other controls in place that if, you know, if this happens, then the survey is pulled out because they really want it, they, they do as, as much as they can to ensure that the kids who have, who have answered have answered honestly. I mean, the reality is, you know, I can make up whatever, but if I'm, I'd have to be really good at what I've made up and be consistent with it throughout the entire length of the survey for that to still get in there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say that everybody has that, that foresight when they're completing it, because what would be the purpose? Right. It's, it's, it's totally anonymous. It's not impacting you know, what's going to happen to you specifically in any way. So we like to believe that this is some pretty valid information mm -hmm. from youth. And of all the kids that participated, um, I want to say countywide, there were only around 100 surveys that were pulled out as invalid. Now, that's not done by our office. This right. is, there's a company that handles that. And then um, PCCD makes sure that the information gets out to everyone. Yeah, so this is as accurate as could uh, as Absolutely. Could, this as is possibly. probably and one of the best tools. And it's not saying that maybe it's uh, 100%, but at no. least it does. It gives you some idea. Information. So people should take us seriously and it's reliable yes. and you know uh, so I mean might not you know is it a hundred percent well maybe not but it's as good as it yes. can as it can be and I, it's, it's meant more as a guide more than yes. anything I think it's important to mention too that our, our averages um, looked at all of those youth together mm -hmm. so you know our, our 40 some percent looked at 6th 8th 10th and 12th graders mm -hmm. If we broke that out individually by, you know, what did six, just 6th graders say, what did 8th graders say, you know, 10th, what did 12th graders say, the numbers for 12th graders were a bit higher, but that's because the numbers for 6th graders were a bit lower. So that, you know, that right. average is looking at all across all the kids across. that were surveyed, 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th. So that should, again, mean something because right. if you want to look at, well, then that means that there were 6th graders that said that they tried alcohol in the last 30 days. Yes. So it might have been a significantly lower number than the 12th graders, but again, looking at averages, you have, you have a very low number. That means that the, the higher number means to, needs to be much higher right. for us to still end up with that, you know, 47 percent. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, so where do we go from here? Now, the, the numbers are the school districts have more yes. broken down by school districts. Yes. And um, I'm very happy more to complete. Uh, data or with specific data. to their district um, we, we were able to provide to all of them their own information specific to their district so that they can look at you know maybe if their numbers were a little bit different than the county or even greatly different than the county that they could address their particular issues and our office has has, has offered technical assistance for every district that wants to look at okay now what do we do with this here's information now what do you the information is just that it's no, it's right. numbers it's information now we need to figure out what to do with it um, so that has been given to all of them. What we are interested in is, is at the county level, and that sort of helps drive our programs and what we want to focus on. So there are so many things that, that, that we could look at that, that we want to combat. We talked about prescription drug use. We talked, you know, there's tobacco use, there's alcohol, there's marijuana, there's so many things. I only have so many resources. So in order to sort of run our business, I need to make sure that we're spending we're spending our resources in where it's going to have the biggest impact. 
So that's why we're, we wanted to know what exactly the kids were saying. Mm -hmm. And those, the, the top substances that they're talking about, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, uh, as I said before, I wasn't shocked by that. Now, th what the specific numbers would be and to what the percentage rates were, that I wasn't sure. I had some guesses, but that the idea that it was going to be alcohol and tobacco and marijuana, that I was 100% prepared for. Again, it's just information. We, what people need to look at is, you know, uh, you know, were you surprised by it? Because if if someone tells me, like, I was expecting that it was going to be like 90% of kids that they were drinking. All right, well, let's say that that was. If you weren't, what does that say about your perception about youth and whether or not it's okay? Because if many people felt that 90% of kids were drinking, but nobody was really working to do anything to stop it, then what kind of a message have we sent to youth? I think everyone is drinking and I'm not bothered by that, so they're going to take that as an endorsement that that's mm -hmm. okay. Uh, on the flip side, if you were, comp I can't believe that there were, you know, 50% of kids said that they were drinking. Well, you, that's information too. You need to be aware of that because if you interact with youth, even if you don't have kids, let's say you're a teacher or you're a coach or, you know, you interact with youth in some way, then you need to sort of have that in the back of your head so it's easier for you to pick up on some red flags that could be impacting them. I mean, we said earlier we don't want youth to, to experiment with those substances because they're at such a, a, a dangerous age that could set them up for dependence later on. So we really want to delay that. And the information is just that. That's why we wanted to do it. We're, we're very hopeful that we'll be able to do PAYS the next time that it comes around, which will be this fall. So somewhere in so like September 2013. Benchmark now, so now we can see yes. in a couple of years, you know, how it's, or the things seem to be getting better. Yeah, what's going on? Or what's going worse on? Or whatever. Okay, well, that's going to wrap up our show today. I want to thank Eric Usher from the Fayette County thank Drug you. and Alcohol Commission coming on and talking about the uh, problems that we have here in Fayette County. And hopefully people will be more aware. And at least now, like we say, at least now we have kind of a, uh, some information, some mm -hmm. data to go by. And, you know, we'll see where, where we go with this in the future. We're ready for, for extra support, so if anyone wants to be involved, call me, and we'll get you involved in any way. Okay, well, thanks for being thank on you. the show. And I want to thank you for watching. My name is Mark O'Keefe. I'm executive editor for the Herald Standard, and we'll see you later.